Hello, um, my name is Christopher McCrudden. I'm a professor at uh, Queen's University Belfast in the School of Law and um, a global visiting professor at uh, the University of Michigan Law School. And I'm a fellow of the British Academy. Um, this talk is part of the Imagine Belfast Festival 2021. And I'm delighted to be uh, speaking to you today the topic of my comment um, is on the interpretation of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, or rather the interpretations, plural, um, of the agreement, uh, depending on whether the interpreter considers it primarily a legal, political, or historical document. So when we drill down into the agreement, there is much in the text that's less clear than we might have wanted. So who are the people of Northern Ireland on whom so much of the text rests? What's the status of power sharing in the event of a referendum, for example, opting for unity between Northern Ireland and Ireland? What role can the British government appropriately play during the referendum campaign? Um, is a referendum in favor of unity required in order for required in Ireland in order to allow unification to take place? Or even more recently, what's the meaning of consent uh, in the idea of the principle of consent in the agreement? So, so basically the issue that I want to talk about is how we should go about interpreting that agreement. More broadly, perhaps still, what exactly is the agreement? So it's clearly a text with considerable historical resonances and with an emerging history of its own. It was a hard fought political bargain between the contending communities of Northern Ireland. But it's also an agreement between two sovereign states that's binding in international law and thus gives rise to legal obligations on those states. It also has a legal status at the domestic level in both Ireland and in the United Kingdom, both of which indeed partially incorporated the agreement into their respective legal systems. In the former case in, in Ireland by way of constitutional referendum in, in the UK by way of legislation, primarily the Northern Ireland Act. So in light of all of this, how should we interpret the agreement? In particular, how should we interpret it when the text appears controversial or less than clear? Now by this question of interpreting the agreement, I don't mean what does such and such a provision mean uh, at the narrow level, but rather what are the methods by which we should seek to give meaning to the agreement? To put it more accurately, if, if somewhat more um, pretentiously, what are the hermeneutics of the agreement? In other words, what are the principles of interpretation that apply to the agreement? The, the question um, I'm suggesting is that this is a complicated question. And, and worth pondering because of the many different ways of looking at the agreement and thus the opportunity for multiple um, and sometimes competing hermeneutics. So the perspective of a political scientist is likely to differ significantly from that of a constitutional lawyer or from that of an historian or an international judge, leading to the potential, I suggest, for different principles of interpretation to be applied and as a result, different understandings of the agreement result. And this may well be done in the utmost good faith. We don't have to build into this process any element of bad faith to see that different interpretations may well arise. So there are existing several ex intriguing divergences between the principles of interpretation uh, that derive from a view of the agreement as a political compromise um, those that derive from the historian and those who view it as a legally binding agreement. So there are, of course, considerable differences within the respective disciplines of history, law and politics, but some broad differences are apparent in how these different disciplines interpret texts. Those coming to the interpretation of the agreement wearing an historian's hat, for example, tend to adopt the view that the agreement should be interpreted, at least to some extent, in light of what the intentions of the drafters and the politicians were at the time of the agreement, 
Now, the details of the negotiations in which the agreement was concluded are now relatively well known, at least in outline. Several things seem to be clear about what happened in those exciting days uh, before Easter 1998. By the end, the negotiations were rushed. The negotiators were close to exhaustion. The drafting was often haphazard and the different strands in which the negotiations were conducted were only loosely patched together. The famous ambiguity of the agreement was not always intentional or strategic. Sometimes it just resulted from a somewhat chaotic process. Viewing the agreement historically, gauging the intention of the parties on any particular issue in such a way as to attempt to lead to a definitive interpretation is more likely than not to lead to the conclusion that the agreement doesn't address the issue at all. But the principles of interpretation commonly followed by lawyers, on the other hand, are generally not that concerned with whether or not the founding fathers or mothers of the agreement knew what they were doing or discussed it or intended a particular result. Whether the drafters thought about what they actually achieved is, from that point of view, neither here nor there. The issue for lawyers is rather what the text says, interpreted against the background of what the aims of those parts of the agreement is a name that can be gleaned from the structure and purpose of the agreement and the fact that it's nested in international law obligations more broadly. For political scientists, or at least for students of politics for whom power and ideology are central, whilst sharing lawyers' skepticism of purely historical interpretations, legal interpretations may also seem naive, if not downright obtuse. It's obvious, surely, say politician or political scientists, that the relationship between interpretation and politics is more complex than the simple lawyer's account presupposes. The interpretation of texts, in other words, is made a more overtly political enterprise. Such politics scholars don't have to resort to the dubious claims that textual interpretations are only ideological and instigated by power, suggesting that they're also shaped by ideology and power is sufficient to make their point. So as the agreement moves closer and closer to centre stage in Anglo-Irish relations and potentially to UK-EU relations uh, post-Brexit, the interpretation of the agreement will become more and more contested. The temptation, of course, is for each interpreter to become, as lawyers would say, results driven, meaning that the method that produces the favored substantive result is adopted rather than the method that's most appropriate for the situation in which the question of interpretation arises. That's not the way forward. If the agreement is to retain and, and one hopes increase its legitimacy over time, we'll be increasingly presented in the future with a confrontation between differing and conflicting hermeneutics, an historical hermeneutic, a legal hermeneutic and a political science hermeneutic. We need to discuss these differences if we're not to talk past each other in the serious debates that will occur inevitably as to how the, the agreement should be interpreted and possibly even endang endangering its future. What I've tried to do in this talk is intended to encourage such conversations. Thank you for listening. <laughs>